The A of Carl. Welcome to part 7 of James Bonwick's 1894 publication titled Irish Druids and Old Irish Religions. Now, this is part 2 of the book in which we're going to be dealing with chapters involved with Old Irish Religions. We already discussed in the series of videos 1 to 6 with uh, the Irish Druids and the Academia of 1894. These chapters we'll be starting with for part 2 will be the introduction into the 1894 academic thinking of what the old religions were and then we've we'll gone a long chapter dealing with Irish superstitions based on thinking in 1894 as well. Grandma Albert. An introduction to the early religions of the Irish. One of the most philosophical statements from Max Muller is to this effect, quote, Whatever we know of early religion, we always see it as uh, presupposes vast periods of an early development. End quote. This is exhibited in the history of all peoples that have progressed in civilization, though we may have to travel far back on the track of history to note transformations of thought or belief. When the late Dr. Birch told us that a pyramid several hundreds of years older than the Great Pyramid contained the name of Osiris, we knew that at least the Osirian part of Egyptian mythology was honoured some six or seven thousand years ago. What the earlier development of religion there was, or how the conception of a dying and risen Osiris arose at so remote a period, may well excite our wonder. Professor Jeb writes, quote, There was a time when early men began to speak of the natural powers as persons, and yet not forgotten that they were really natural powers and that the person's names were merely signs." Unquote. Yet this goes on an assumption that religion, or rather dogmas thereof, sprang from reflections upon natural phenomena. In this way, the French author of Cyrus satisfied himself particularly on philosophical grounds that the idea of God sprang from association with thunder and the barking of a dog. We are assured by Max Muller that religion is a word that has changed from a century to century, and that, quote, the word rose to the surface thousands of years ago, unquote. Taking religion to imply an inward feeling of reverence towards the unseen and a desire to act in obedience to the inward law of right, religion has existed long as humanity itself. What is commonly assumed by the word religion, by writers in general, is dogma or belief. It is important of this subject as well as put forth by the great Sanskrit scholar in the phrase, quote, the real history of man is a history of religion, unquote. This conviction lends interest and weight to any investigations into the ancient religion of Ireland. Although Plowden held that, quote, few histories are so charged with fables as the annals of Ireland, unquote. It was Herder who finally said, quote, our earth owes the seeds of a higher culture to a religious tradition whether literally or or, unquote. In proportion as the so-called supernatural gained an ascendancy, so was man really advancing from the materialism and brutishness of savagedom. Lecky notes, quote, the disposition of man in certain stages of society towards miraculous, end quote, but was buckled quite correct in maintaining that, quote, all nature conspired to increase the authority of the imaginative faculties and weaken the authority of the reasoning ones. Unquote. It is not to be forgotten in our inquiry that, as faith arose in the East, science has exerted its force on the West. Fetishism can hardly be regarded as the origin of religion. As to the writers who see in the former of the deification of natural objects, Max Muller remarks, quote, They might as well speak of primitive men mummifying their dead bodies before they had wax to embalm them with. Unquote. It has been styled in the base of religion, not less than history, but how was it begotten? Butler, in English, Irish and Scottish churches, writes, quote, To separate the fabulous from the probable and the probable from the true will require no ordinary share of penetration and persevering industry, unquote. We have certainly to remember, as one has said that, quote, Mythic history, mythic theology, mythic science are like records, not of facts but beliefs. End quote. Andrew Lang properly calls our attention to language as embodying thought, being so liable to misconception and misinterpretation. Names connected with myths have been so invariably read and explained by scholars that outsiders may well be puzzled.
how rapidly a myth grows and is greedily accepted because of the wish that may be true is exemplified in the pretty story immortalized in by music of Jesse of Lucknow, who in the siege heard her deliveries in the remote distance playing, quote, the Campbells are coming, unquote. There never was, however, a Jesse Brown. There was at the time, and as one as Jesse has herself, quote, being sent to join William Tell and the other dethroned gods and goddesses, unquote. In the Hibbert Lectures, Professor Rees observes, quote, the Greek myth which distressed the thoughtful and pious minds like that of Socrates was a survival like the other scandalous tales about the gods from the time when the ancestors of the Greeks were savages, unquote. May it not rather have been derived by Homer through the trading Phoenicians from the older mythologies of India and Egypt, which altered names and scenes to suit the poet's day and clime. It was scarcely due to say with a theory, quote, in legend alone rests real history, for legend is living tradition, and three times out of four it is truer than what we would call history, unquote. According to Froude, quote, Legends grew as nursery tales grow now. There is a reason to believe that religious theogonies and heroic tales of every nation that has left a record of itself but are practical accounts of the first impressions produced upon mankind by the phenomena of day and night, morning and evening, winter and summer. Unquote. Such may be a partial explanation, but it may also be assumed that they were placed on record by the scientific holders of esoteric wisdom as problems or studies for eclutication by disciples. The anthropological works by Sir John Lubbock and Dr. Trailer can be consulted with profit upon the subject of primitive religious thought. Hayes O'Grady brings us back to Ireland saying, quote, who shall thoroughly discern the truth from the fiction which is everywhere entwined and in many places altogether overlaid. There is at a, one time a vast amount of zeal ingenuity and research expended on the eclutication and confirming of these fables, which, if properly applied, would have done Irish history and archaeology good service instead of making their very names synonymous with among strangers with fancy and delusion." Unquote. After this, we can proceed with the Irish legends and myths, the introduction to this inquiry being a direction to the current superstitions of this race. Irish Superstitions the particular superstitions of a people will often throw a light upon their ancient faiths. Bering Gould has remarked, quote, Much of the religion of the lower orders, which we regard as essentially divine, is ancient heathenism, refined with Christian symbols. Unquote. Whatever doubt may be felt as to this, all must admit the underlying paganism of some customs, creedences, or sayings. Gom tells us that, quote, The local fetishism to be found in Aryan countries simply represents the undying fate of the older race. Unquote. Dr. Todd, on his work on Irish religion, ventured on more tender ground when he wrote concerning the Garsman's Cry of Patrick. Quote, the prayer which it contains against women, smiths, and druids, together with the invocation of the powers of the sky, the sun, fire, lightning, etc proves that, notwithstanding the undoubted piety and fervent Christian faith of the author, he had not yet fully shaken off the pagan prejudices. Unquote. Geraldus Gambrianus declared that the Irish, at the conquest by Henry II, justified their condemnation by the Pope, quote, being more ignorant than all other nations of the first principles of the faith. End quote. The legends of the English and French might be shown to contain a vast amount of questionable common sense and faith, but our present inquiry is to trace the underlying opinions of the ancient Irish. Leaving outside the so-called juridical megalithic monuments about the origin which, in circles, pillars, etc., we know little or nothing beyond speculation, and which are scattered almost all over the globe, we notice that in the Irish contains notions and practices connected with stones that reflect the manner of former times. The stone of Cum Col, near Tipperary, produced blindness to those who gazed on it. Stones of speculation, the Amisseth, used to draw fire, were much revered. One object in the Irish Museum of brass cased in silver, six inches by four, has a precious crystal in the centre set round with coloured stones. 
the footprints of the angel Victor were to be seen on a stone in Down County as the celestial being alighted to deliver his message on high to Patrick. In the glimpses of Aaron by S. and Alice Milligan, an interesting notice occurred in the brash or bull and stones in County Cork. Though there is a specimen at the seven churches of Glendalough. The, quote, the upper surface of this monument, end quote, says they, quote, is indented with four deep basin-shaped hollows. Two of them, the smallest, are quite close to each other at one edge. The other two, of larger size, are at the opposite edge. The devotee placed his or her knees in the smaller hollows and repeated a certain number of prayers, dropped an offering of some minute article to the larger. This operation, with certain rounds and washings at the well, was deemed specific for rheumatic pains and other ailments. End quote. It added of the brash superstition, quote, This is a pagan cultus, which all power of Christianity. The personal influence of the cleric and national education have not been able to obliterate. End quote. A respectable farmer declared that he was not above saying a prayer at the Blessed Stone when he came that way. The water found in the hollows of Bull and Stones was held good for bad eyes. Upright standing stones or dolans, the same authorities assure us, are reverence as the idolatrous India. Mr. Milligan says, Quote, the Inish Murray women kneel before these stones and pray that they may be delivered from the perils of childbirth. End quote. Bridget Stone at the Farard in County Loud was, has a raised work around it, with Bridget's pillar near the pond steps round which the devotees walk. The Clock of Breca, or Speckled Stones of Inish Murray in Sligo, are thus described by Dr. O'Donovan. Quote, they are round stones of various sizes and arranged in such order that they cannot be easily reckoned. And if you believe the natives, they cannot be reckoned at all. These stones are turned and, if I understand them rightly, their order changed by the inhabitants on certain occasions when they visit the shrine to wish good or evil against their neighbours. An heir or a long curse has often been thus hurled against a private enemy. There is no account of the people as recorded of some Celts worshipping a bloody spear or one place upon a vase upon the altar, as with the Scythians. Both Spencer in Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth's time observed the Irish drink blood in a certain ceremony and swear by the right hand of their chiefs. Solinus, in the early Christian centuries, might have heard strange tales of Aaron when he left this record. Quote, it is a surly savage race. The soldier, in the moment of victory, takes a draught of his enemy's blood and smears his face with the gore. The mother puts up by his first food for luck on the end of her husband's sword and light pushes it into the infant's mouth with a prayer to the gods of her tribe so her son may have a soldier's death. End quote. The evil eye was an object of dread and penalties concerning it are conspicuous in the old Breton laws. The Sewell Ballers or Ballers Eye relates to one Baller who was able by an eye to strike a foe dead. Though potions, on the contrary, are referred to with many ancient songs. Persons were put under vows to do or not to do a thing. They were said to be under a gisa. This was often opposed by certain spells or charms. Raising the wind, so valuable a power in sailing days, was the privilege of a few and had both areas down in the last century. Windbound, windbound fishermen of the Hebrides, too, used to walk sunrise around the chapel of Flada in Flaladon Isle and pour water upon a round, bluish-looking stone. This effectually raised the wind. The gods then kept the wind in bags. Not so long ago, old women in the Shetlands would sell wind to sailors. Dreams have played a great part in Ireland. In Patrick's Confession, they are referred to. Professor O'Curry explains the meaning attached to them by the peasantry. Auguries are taken from the flight of birds, from beasts and the appearance of clouds. Prodigies were not always perceived by favoured parties. Thus we read in one poem, quote, The king alone beheld the terrible sight, and he foresaw the death of his people. End quote. Showers of blood were thus beheld, bars at times recognising the sounds of approaching death on the strings of their harps. Miracles were of ordinary occurrence and of varied character. Tales were told of early saints crossing the Irish Sea by standing upon their garments laid upon the water. They are similar to what is noted in Butcher's Le Saint Graal, 
where a number of Christians came to Britain upon Joseph or Arimathea's shirt, which grew in size with the number of mounting on it. Transformations, especially into animal forms, have been implicitly believed in by the peasantry. Some perceive in the in this this system of totemism. Professor Rees has led to recognise a dog totem in Ireland from the number of dog names. Conair, son of bird, was not eat a bird, and Cook Cullen, the hero named after dog, was told not to eat a dog. He was ruined by breaking the order. Quote, the descendants of the wolf in Austria, quote, we are told in Wonders of Aaron, quote, who transformed themselves into wolves, end quote. The wolf was a totem of Austria. Druids, as traditions related, could change men into animals or trees. The Aliel's darker suspicions, sorry, darker superstitions of Ireland or Scotland use a number of such transformation stories. Thus, Minerva changed Ulysses for fear of his enemies. Quote, she spake, then touched him with her powerful wand. The skin shrunk up and withered at her hand. A swift old age o'er all his members spread. A sudden frost was sprinkled upon his head. End quote. An Indian changed himself into a mouse to catch a, a fairy dancer. So many Irish tales relate transformations, though for more war stratagem than love beguilements. Andrew Lang, referring to Cupid and Psyche, equally applicable to other superstitions, observes, quote, We explain the separation of the lovers as a result of breaking a taboo or one of etiquette binding among men and women as well as between men and fairies, end quote. Witchcraft, conscious or unconscious exercise of a power peculiar to some persons in greater or lesser degree of controlling little heeded or understood laws of nature, was ever common in Ireland. Witches, or pitags, bushocks, or togs. These had the mark, or seal of the devil, in reddening the skin which would retain for hours an indentation upon it. Recently, it has been ascertained by a philosopher that a sensitiveness in certain individuals exists even beyond their bodies so that they suffer without being actually touched. In a tradition respecting Khan of the Hundred Battles, the hero Egon was to told by three women that he should be slain in the coming fight. Upon his asking their names, they replied, Our names are A, Lan, and Lana. We are the daughters of Trodon the magician. A witch who sought to rescue a hero surrounded by foes induced the tribesmen to leave him and attack some rocks which they were hypnotized to believe were armed soldiery. The witches tied knots on a string and breathed on them with a curse of the object of their hateful incantation. Some persons, however, were clever enough when finding such a charmed string to undo the knots and so prevent the calamity. The Quran contains a prayer for delivery, quote, from the mischief of women blowing on knots, end quote. Incantations were common in Ireland. A, stod, a study, sorry, a story in Erse. Pandian O'Kelly was a man riding aloft upon a besom. A giant blew a young man to a distant rat and sent him into a heavy sleep. A giant got from a little green man a black cap, like Jack the Giant Killer's cap of darkness, and gave it to the King of Ireland's son that he may be invisible at his leisure. Other superstitious traditions, more or less hypnotic, may be mentioned. A thimble was given by a fairy to a young man to serve as a boat. A large white cat declared herself a woman 300 years old. Riding on fairy horses, carrying off princesses through the air, using swords that give light, sending weasels to bring money, turning into flying beetles, forcing into magical sleep, and even restoring youth, were some of the wonders. A black dog was sent was said to be a hag's father. Adepts could turn into vultures, swans, wolves, etc. But according to Hyde's folklore, witches could be released by masses. A hag or a witch was a grac in Celtic Welsh. So George Grey in his New Zealand narratives has several instances of enchantment like those of Irish times. One old woman via spells held a boat so that it could be not be launched. Again, quote, early in the morning, Cun performed incantations by which he kept all the people in the cave in a profound sleep. End quote. A sorcerer baked food in an enchanted oven to kill a party. Of another, quote, he smote his hands in on the threshold of the house and every soul in it was dead. End quote. There was an Irish charm for the Tutek. Quote, May the thumb of a chosen Thomas on the side of Guileless Christ 
heal my teeth without lamentation from worms and from pangs. End quote. Charms of a particular kind were employed to ward off evil. Of these, more potent was the feminine sign of the horseshoe over the threshold, was the celebrated Sheila Nagy. The writer, many years ago, was shown some of the stranger fing- figures in the reserved repositories of the British Museum. That was the squatting figure of an exposed naked female, rudely sculptured, not unlike, except in size, the singular colossi of the museum porch brought in from the Easter Isle. This figure was taken down from over a doorway of an ancient church in Ireland and was without doubt a relic of pagan days used during many Christian centuries to ward off evil from the incoming congregation. Another stood by the moat of Hout. In the stone chips of E.T. Stephen, we have the following, quote, The horseshoe is still the conventional figure for the Yoni in Hindu temples. And although its original importance was lost, until lately, the horseshoe was held to be a charm against witchcraft and the evil eye amongst ourselves, precisely as the case in the more un- unmistakable Sheen and Ligui at certain churches in Ireland. The Dublin Museum contains an extraordinary bone pin representing the Sheen and Ligui, and evidently a charm to shield the wearer. It was found alongside a skull in a field. Wilde declared that the Roscommon child was taken from the grave to obtain its arms for charm purposes. Popular holidays are still associated with the ideas of former heathen festivals. May Day, or Bealtaine, in some parts of Ireland, has its female mummers who dance and hurl, wearing a holly bush. A masked clown carries a pail of water with a mop for spreading its contents abroad. Boys in St. Carol's, as in France. In the south-east of Ireland, a girl is chosen as a May Queen, residing in all May makings till she is married. May Eve having its dangers from fairies, and etc., is spent in making cattle safe from the milk-thieving little people by causing the cows to leap over the fires. Dairy maids prudently drive their cows along the mystical rowan stick. Of the phallic maypole set up in St. John's Eve, or Midsummer's Day, in O'Kearney remarks, the pole was eventually used by the druidical ceremonies. Yule cakes were nur cakes. Hogmany was observed, as in Scotland, hog as a a Chaldean festival. Irish pagan feasts were announced by the blowing of long horns, two or three yards in length, some of which are to be seen in Dublin Museum. The Christmas candle of South West Ireland was burnt until midnight on Christmas Eve, and the remnant kept as a preser- preser- sorry, preservative against evil spirits until next year's candle was set up. Magic ointment was ve- revealed the invisible. All Saints Day perpetuated the pagan sound of November Eve. Holy cakes or sometimes as triangular bannocks, or then eaten as soul mass cakes. November Eve, says Mrs. Bryant's Celtic Ireland, quote, is sacred to the spirits of the dead. In the Western Islands, the old superstition is dying very hard, and tradition is still well alive. It is dangerous to be out on November Eve, because it is one night of the year when the dead come out of their graves to dance with the fairies on the hills, and, as it is their night, they do not like to be disturbed, end quote. Funeral games are held in our houses. In olden times, it's thought our dead heroes could help in distress. Quote, Twice during the treen of Taltine, each day at sunrise I invoked Mac Eve to remove me from the pestilence. End quote. The keens, or lamentations for the dead, are connected with ancient and hedonist practices. Professional howlers are charred in, had charge of the corpse. Rich, who wrote in 1610 of a keen, remarked, Quote, a stranger at the first encounter would believe that a quantity of hags or hellish fiends were carrying a dead body to some infernal mansion. End quote. But some of the death songs have great beauty of composition. Sheila Lee's Lament is a fine example. It is thus translated from the earth. Quote, Sing the wild keen of my country, ye whose heads bent in sorrow, in the house of the dead. Lay aside the wheel and flax, and sing not in joy for there is a spare loft in my cabin. Onin, the pride of my heart, is not here. Do not hear the cry of the banshee crossing the lovely Kilcumper. Or, was there a voice from the tomb far sweeter than song that whistled in the mountain wind and told you that the young oak was fallen? Yes, he is gone. He has gone off in the spring of life, like the blossom of the prickly hawthorn scattered by the merciless wind on the cold clammy earth. Raise the keen, ye whose notes were well known, Tell your beads, ye young women who grieve. Lie down his narrow house in mooring, and his spirit will sleep and be at rest. Plant, 
planted shamrock and wild firs near his head, that strangers may know who is fallen. Soon again will your keen be heard on the mountain. Far before the cold sod is sodded over the breast of my Onin, Sheila, the mothers of Keeners, will be there. The voice, which before was loud and plaintive, was still and silent, like the ancient harp for a country. End quote. Another exclaimed, quote, My sunshine you were, I loved you better than the sun itself. And when I see the sun going down in the west, I think of my boy and my black night of sorrow. Like the rising sun, he had a red glow on his cheek. He was as bright as the sun at midday, but a dark storm came in and my sunshine was lost to me forever. End quote. No one would claim for the Keynes as Christian origin. The Reverend John Wesley saw a funeral in 1750 and wrote, quote, I was exceedingly shocked at the Irish howl which followed. It was not a song, but a dismal, inarticulate yell set up at the grave by four shrill voiced women who were hired for the purpose. And I saw not one that shed a tear, for it seems not to be in the bargain. End quote. Mrs. Harrington, in 1818, had this account of a professional keener, a descendant of a pagan performance. Quote, before she began to repeat, usually, she usually mumbled for a short time with her eyes closed, rocking her body backward and forward, as if keeping in time with the measure of the verse. She then commenced in a kind of whining recitative, but as she proceeded, as the composition required it, her voice assumed a variety of deep and fine tones. End quote. Her eyes continued to shut while repeating, with some variations, that it may be an ancient poem. It is said of Curran that he derived his earliest ideas of eloquence from the hired mourner's lamentation over the dead. Dryden refers to the ancient practice, quote, The women mix their cries and clamour fills the fields, the warlike wakes continued all the night, and fewer games were played at a new returning light. End quote. With so imaginable and ignorant a people, as I suppose spiritual set of creatures, played a great part in daily life, and these ancient ideas were not entirely driven off by the march of the schoolmaster. Scotland, with its centuries of parish schools, retained many superstitions to a very late date, as the clergyman of Kirk Michael Perchshire declared he had found there in 1795. Some spirits answered to those described by Plato as, quote, Between God and man, they are the demons, our spirits, who are always near us, though commonly invisible to us and know our thoughts. End quote. The Reverend R. Kirk left a record in 1691 that, Quote, the very devils conjured in any country do answer the language of the place. And yet he is certain that the Celt in his northern home, they lost power over him, as they were the demons Loki. End quote. In some cases, there were the ghouls feeding on human flesh, flesh, causing the man or woman to gradually waste away unless an exorcism was practiced in time. Would that men had found such comfort in the belief of good spirits that he has suffered fears from the belief in evil ones? There is still, alas, in this world more thought of a jealous and avenging deity than one of benevolent and paternal. Subterranean spirits may dwell in burning mountains, or occupy themselves in mining, and the storing of treasure. Many Irish legends relating to such, they may appear as the dim she, dressed in green and mysterious intent. The others represent themselves restlessly moving over water. Not a few sought amusement by destroying at night what parts of a church had been constructed in the day. Hence, the need, in certain cases, to bury a live man, woman, or child under these foundations. Tradition says that Columba, thus tormented, buried Orn in his own request under the monastery of Iona. The Pukas have left some marks in Ireland. There is Castle Puka or Cargapuka in Cork, a Puk cavern in County Wicklow. Pope calls it. Quote, a dusky, melancholy sprite, as ever sullied the fair race of night. End quote. Hookahs have been seen running from hill to hill. Their shapes vary like the buddocks of the Hebrides. The chloricon or leprechaun is a mischievous old fellow dressed in, in a green coat, but without brogues. Quote, the Scottish elf who quaffs with swollen lips the ruby wine, draining the cellar with free hand, as if it was his purse and he never lacked a coin. End quote. In the religious beliefs of the pagan Irish by O'Byrne Crow is a reference at the Morgan, which once appeared in the shape of a bird, quote, addressing the famous bull donned in a dark and serious language. End quote. Quote, in another occasion she appears to coo in the form of a beautiful lady and tells him that she's in love with him and has brought him her gems and her cattle. Coo said 
that he had something else in love to attend to at the time. She said that when he would next engage in single combat, she would, in the shape of a serpent, coil herself around his feet and hold him fast for his adversary. End quote. Of the mysterious banshee, much has been said and sung. She is often attached to certain families and even septs, and gives notice of coming calamities. She is the banshee of Irish and Cover or Tylthut of Welsh, whom it has failed to meet or listen to her shrieks. As an old woman, she is the white or house fairy. In this sense, she is to draw nigh at the time of death and bear the soul to its fairy home. The white lady of Anvil was a banshee. There is a curious old legend about a lady whose father shut her up in a tower on Tory Island with twelve matrons in charge and were to keep her from the sight of a man. All went well until McLeanly consulted the banshee of the mountain. Telling him to dress in women's garments, she ferried him over to the island, asking shelter for a noble lady chased by an enemy. Landing the young man, she threw the dozen guardians into a druidic sleep and left the couple together a while, afterwards drawing the man ashore. Serious results ensued. Fairies are more pronounced in Irish than in English traditions. They are fairly represented in the west of Scotland, in Wales, Lancaster and Cornwall, parts frequented by Irish fiends and foes. They are the Shi, the Dumaha, or good people. Barshi, of the supernatural world, are Irish forms of the Welsh Tilwigit, the fair family, Swedish Nissen, Danish Damhest, Polish Rotori, the Russian, sorry, Russian Domavori, English Puck, El Fe, or Robin Goodfellow, Cornish Pixie, Burmese Nats, Breton Corrigan, or Coral, Scotch Brownie, Norwegian Trolls or Nis, Oriental Jin, Jewish Skinnedom, Italian Fata, Greek Parsia, or Illuminates. Quote, that which is neither ill nor well, that which belongs not nor in heaven or hell. End quote. Because many are represented as little people, writers have fancied the idea was but a tradition of pre-existing races, small stature, who are improved off by visitors or marauders of large growth. Dwarfs or dooses are taught in Brittany to haunt the dolmens or ancient graves, though in some manner they are known as the ghosts of druids. Certainly African bears evidence of a widespread pygmy race. They are Dokos of South Abyssinia, Obongo of West Africa, Aka of Central Africa, Batua living in trees like monkeys and other in Congo, etc. The fairies are associated with mankind at present, though they may carry off their children, replacing them with changelings. The mannequins may be white, brown, grey or yellow. Some are small enough to sit in ears of corn, while others fly about on magic horses. It is said to know that the little people indulge in faction fights and pinch those who dance with them. Giants figure less often. The Book of Leinster tells of a giant looter who had 14 heads wooing Gabal, the charms extended over 50 cubits. Cubits. Occasionally, these little people are not content with stealing babies and won't run off with men, as Nia of the Golden Hair did with the Irish Fenian warrior. The busy Macusid, who worked underground, were more worthy of offerings than the Capit, who caused eclipses by catching hold of the moon. It is discreet always to speak well of fairies as they listen without being seen. Their females look after men as their males look after women. They are kings and queens. Oberon or Elbrick was a king and Titania was a queen. The Irish say that Don, the Miletian leader drowned in a storm raised by the Tuas, became a king of the Fays. Inishman, now Isle of Man, was also called from Manon, an ancient chief transformed into a royal she. Mab, daughter of King Ickert, uh, Falak, became queen of the fairies, being more than immortalised in Spencer's fairy queen. Another king of the fairies was the two of Fin Finmar, the Welsh fairy king known as Gweth Ab Nud. As with spirits of air, earth and water are numerous, it is a comfort to learn that from the Talmud that while the bad ones are exactly 7,405,926, the good ones number in the rougher estimate of 1,064,314,000, Thousand, thousand. There's a lot here. 
Black fairies are not conspicuous unless in the mines. The Maoris of New Zealand assure us that their merry little fays are not of their dark colour, but fair like Englishmen. They love the hills of Wakato. A chief frightened of them took off his arms and gave them away. As soon as they finished their song, as he told the tale, they took the shadows of the Maori's earrings and handed them about uh, to one or to the other. As all know, the fairies are Paris are suffering from misconduct from happier climes. Christian tradition holds their final redemption. Irish fairies are thus mourned by, for by D. F. McCarthy. Quote, Ah, the pleasant time hath vanished, ere our wretched doubtings banished. All the graceful spirit people, children of the earth and sea, whom in days now dim and olden, when the world was fresh and golden, every mortal could behold in haunted rat and tower and tree, they vanished, they are banished, ah, how sad for the loss of thee. End quote. Some were not so pleasant. Quote, While the puka's horse holds its frantic course o'er the wooden mountain fall, and the banshees croon a rhythmic rhyme from the crumbling's ivied wall. End quote. As elsewhere noted, the Irish fairies were intimately associated with the druidical, ghostly, or magical tours. When these were conquered by the Milesians, they betook themselves to the hill and survived as fairies. The good people have also been thought to be druidesses. The English lubber fiend of Milton is doubtlessly the Irish uh, Lurigdon. The she were of many varieties. As the far she was the man of the she, so was the banshee, the woman of the she. They are magical deceivers. They build fine halls and interfere with battles. Quote, Behold the she before your eyes. It manifests to you it is king's mansion, which was built in the firm Dagda. It was a wonder of court in Amberal Hill. End quote. They might have been deified mortals. Luke Mac Etland had been a thousand years a she. He would sometimes sojourn while on earth. Once he had a son by the fair Dechur, and thus Cucullan became a hero. Caroline, the Irish bar, celebrates the fairy hills of Shebiog and Seamoor in Leitrim. Troops of them on horses followed their King Don and Queen Cleena. The Dina She, or Men of Peace, referred to in the Book of Armagh, were peevish rather than malevolent. Dressed in green, they resented the appearance of human beings in green. They who wanted to see them must select Hallow Eve, walk round their hill nine times when a door would open, revealing the dancing throng. It is dangerous to accept an invitation to come in for a dance as the tripper never returns again to his home. Very inspired bars were liable to be spirited away by their muse, the Lennon She. If she helped them in a composition, they were bound to follow her throughout eternity. Quote, were it not better thou shouldst dwell amongst the young maiden of golden locks, than in the country should be laughing at thy dogged rhyme. End quote. Their mermaids or sea fairies were Moro or Moro. Their hair or teeth were green. We have no record of their pugnacious qualities as the denizens of the land. Aelin, who is lay in old Irish lamenting the death of her husband, had and two songs new. Quote, By the mighty fairy host, there was conflict over the doom fighting over each other. End quote. The evil will befall her tree beloved. They did not then play for a cure she or fair music. The word she is said to be the Celtic roof for a blast of wind. The whirlwind was certainly called the fairy wind. There is a she puma in the boyne, a she nyamta of Roscommon, and she miaha uh, near tomb. She eva, <coughs> sorry, she a ria, a king, or sorry, a hill of Donegal. There are 70 Irish townships beginning with she. Ireland abounds with localities having fairy associations. Joyce gives many. Fionn and his Fenians are in Sleeve na Van Fionn, the mountain of the fair haired woman. Rashi, the Fenian fortress in Isnantrum, the fairies wood in Sligo. Then there are the Shees, or fairy hills in Donegal, the Shions, fairy mounds, and the haunted hills, Shan, Sheena, Shane, and Nochna, Lorcan, the hills of the Chloricon. In Loch Harb, the leprechauns were said to have been provided with good with ground meal for supper by hospital neighbours. There was Banshee's Palace in South Munster and another rock near Mallow. Banshee Avil had a fine place in a rock by Killaloe, and it was she who threw her cloak around the hero Hartigan at the Battle of Clontarf, so rendering him invisible. 
In fact, Joyce is led to exclaim, quote, some parts of Connacht must have been more thickly populated with fairies than with men, end quote. Where are the fairies in Ireland of great antiquity? One has written in Bob Fancy, quote, that the tales of mortals abiding in the fays and their she palaces are founded on the tender preferences shown by the Druidic priestesses of all to favourite worshippers of the Celtic divinities, end quote. Eno Kearney is of the opinion, quote, our fairy tradition are relics of paganism, end quote. Kennedy says, quote, in borrowing these fictions from their heathen predecessors, the Christian storytellers did not take much trouble to correct their laxity on the subject of moral obligations, end quote. Andrew Lang sees the lower mythology, the element and beliefs of a people to do service beneath a thin covering of Christian uniformity. At least we may admit with Professor Strokes that, quote, much of the narrative elements of the classic epics is to be found in popular childish form in primitive fairy tales, end quote. Among the early and latter superstitions, ghosts are very prominent. As many ghost stories rest upon tradition, it may well to bear in mind that the author of The Golden Bow says, quote, the superstitious beliefs and practices may have been handed down by word of mouth are generally of a far more archaic um, type than religions depicted in the most ancient literature of the Aryan race, end quote. It is not easy to laugh at Irish peasants for ghost yarns when all nations from the remotest antiquity accepted them and philosophers like Dr. Johnson, preachers like John Wesley, performers like Luther, poets like Dante and Tasso recognised also spirits. Some, like an author in 1729, made doubt souls returning from heaven. Quote, Nor do I know, said he, whether it would be worth their shifting hell and coming back to this world in the wandering condition those things called ghosts are understood to be, end quote. Others may exclaim with Dr. Johnson, quote, all argument is against it, but all belief is for it, end quote. Thracis, the Jesuit, thinks that they are but souls from purgatory seeking rest. Erber considered, quote, it is against no scripture that souls should come from Hades, end quote. Henry Martin, the French Celtic scholar, said, Quote, the intercourse between earth and heaven is a belief strongly accredited amongst the bards. End quote. Gladstone recognised that the recent Greek dead, quote, are wanderers in the shades, without fixed doom or occupation. End quote. Homer's Odyssey has this reference. Quote, with swarms of spectres rose from deepest hell, with bloodless visage and hideous yell. They scream, they shriek, and groans and dismal sounds, stun my ears and pierce hell's utmost bounds. End quote. Versus shows Aeneas, his father, Ancus. Quote, when thrice round his neck his arms he threw, and thrice the flitting shadows slipped away, like wind or empty dreams that fly by the day. End quote. Suetness tells us the ghost of Caligula walked in Lav Lavinia's garden, where his body is buried, until the house is burnt down. Ecclesiastes speaks of Samuel, Samuel thus. Quote, after his death, he prophesied and showed the king his end. end quote. In the archives of the Royal Society is a manuscript paper, read November 16, 1698, on some quote, apparitions in north of Scotland, in which we are informed that Mr. Mackinney, AM of Oxford, said that they saw apparitions almost every week, and upon his knowledge, they did very frequently foretell the death of persons, which always succeeded accordingly. End quote. Were all these mistaken? Were they under the influence of Herbert Spencer's origin of revisance or wonder organ, which, quote, affords a tangible explanation of mental illusions, end quote. The Irish, like the ancient Jews, held that bad men especially could walk the earth after death, and the English law, almost to our day, allowed a stake to be driven through the body of suicides and murderers to prevent the spirit troubling the living. The Church has its say in the matter. The Council of Elvira, AD 300, forbade the lighting of tapers in cemeteries, as it was uh, apt to disturb the souls of saints, so said the Council of Ilbert. St. Basil is told by a ghost that he killed Julian. Both Ignatius and Ambrose were said to appear to the disciples. No Church has ever denied the existence and appearance of ghosts, and none opposed exorcism in some form or the other. Irish pagans, observes Nicholas O'Kearney, never dreamed of spirits after death having assumed such forms or misty ghosts. The spirits from Elysium always appeared in the prop 
her shape and spoke and acted as if they were still in the enjoyment of mortal life. In this respect, it differs from MacPherson's uh, O'Sheen. The opinion also opposed other descriptions in recognising Irish poems of antiquity. In the poem, Catalonia, as translated in Ireland's Mirror, as this, quote, For Arma, bring me my shield and my spear, bring me my sword, that stream of light. What mean these two angry ghosts that fight in the air? The tin blood runs down their robes of mist, and their half-formed swords like faint meteors fall to sky blue shields. Now they embrace like friends, the sweeping glass pipes through their airy limbs. They vanish. I did not like the sight, but I did not fear it. End quote. The Inverness Gaelic Society has a paper by Donald Ross on the subject saying, quote, Spectres hover gloomily over the reedy marsh of the moor and array themselves on the blasts of winds, and pale ghosts, messengers of the unseen world, brought back the secrets of the grave. End quote. A Gaelic song has a following. Quote, in a blast comes cloudy death and lays his grey head low. His ghost rolled in the vapours of the fenny field. End quote. Henry Martin speaks of, quote, Harps of bards untouched sound mournful over the hill. End quote. Some ghosts were material enough that of St. Kieran of Clomac Noise managed to strike King Fellum. The Inverness Gaelic Society had a paper by Don Ross on the subject saying, Quote, spectres hovered gloomily over the reedy marsh or the moor or arrayed themselves on the blast of the wind and pale ghosts messengers of the unseen world brought back the secrets of the grave. End quote. A Gaelic song has the following, quote, In a blast comes cloudy death and lays his grey head low, his ghost is rolled on the vapours of the fenny field. End quote. Henry Martin speaks of, quote, Harps of bards untouched sound more full or for the hill. End quote. Some ghosts were material enough that of Kevin of Clomac Noise managed to strike King Fellum, the plunder of his church, so effectually with his ghostly crozier as to give an eternal wound of which the chief died. When Fionn appeared to Oscar on the battlefield of Gavra, it is affirmed that quote, his words were not murmurs of distant streams, end quote, but loud and clear. But the fetch is recognised in the scattered poems collected or revised in MacPherson's O'Sheen is more a spirit of the air. Some of the descriptions relating to the ghosts of Aaron and Argyle are striking. Quote, she was like the new moon seen through the gathering mist, like a watery beam of feeble light, when the moon rushes suddenly between two clouds and the midnight shower is on their heat. Clouds, the robe of ghosts, roll their gathered forms on the wind, with robes of light shall... Soon shall our cold pale ghosts meet in a cloud on Kona's eddying winds. Tell her that in a cloud I may meet the lovely maid of Tosker. End quote. Again, quote, Pain light gleams over the heat, the ghosts of Arden pass through and show their dim and distant forms. The misty loader, the house of the spirits of men, ghosts vanish like mists on a sunny hill. His soul came forth to his fathers to the stormy isle. There they pursued boars of mist along the skirts of wind, and moved like the shadows of mist. The ghost of Krugal came from his cave. The stars dimmed, twinkled through his form. His voice was like the sound of a distant stream. End quote. Of one it said, quote, His eyes are like two decaying flames, dark is the wound of his breast. End quote. Krugal, who appeared in dress and form as living but pale, is made by the poet to say, Quote, my ghost is on my native hills, but my corpse is on the sands of Ullan. Thou shalt never talk with Kogol, nor find his lone steps on the heat. Like the darkened moon, he retired to the mist of the whistling blast. End quote. Of another, quote, a cloud, like the steed of the stranger, supported his airy limbs. His robe is the mist of Lano that brings death to the people. His sword is a green meteor half extinguished. His face is without form and void. Some show their dark forms in the chinky rocks. Others fled on the every side and rolled their gathered forms on the wind. One comforts himself with dying. With, my fathers shall meet me at the gates of their airy halls, tall with robes of light and mildly kindled eyes. End quote. A hero cried out, quote, I never fear the ghosts of night, small as their knowledge, weak as their hand. A poet murmurs, I hear at times ghosts of bars and learn their pleasant song. Of a great warrior is said, A thousand ghosts are on the beams of his steel. 
the ghosts of those who are to fall by the king of the resounding Morven, or that Carol barred for his songs that the chiefs may rejoice in their midst of a beautiful woman it is written she is fair as the ghost of the hill and it moves on the sunbeam at noon over the science of morven End quote. a ghost may warn of danger foretell disaster foresee death communicate intelligence whatever may be taught of macpherson's or she there can be no doubt that all the poetical representations of irish ghosts bear pagan and not christian characteristics the traditions coming through Christian centuries have a distinct pagan colouring. The ghosts of Christian times would seem to have left their Christianity on, in this life, becoming heathen on the other side. Other illustrations of Irish superstitions occur in the course of this work, though noted under various heads. The Irish were not more superstitious by nature than their neighbours, but in changing less their abodes and retaining faith in the religion of their fathers, they have clung to old traditions more than those who are subject to greater transitions of place and ideas. After all, as some of the Irish superstitions are the heritage from the past in all lands, can the scientific mind afford to treat them as irrational and absurd? Is experience of all times and all nations utterly worthless? If the photographer's sensitive plate can see more than the human eye and exhibit stars which no telescope can show, are we so sure that nothing exists but what can be revealed by our senses? May we not hinder in our own mental vision by a studied resolution to reject what we cannot explain.